Hallo und herzlich willkommen. The New Hello Normal Shopping, welcome. Einkaufsverhalten New Normal nach shopping. der Pandemie. Das How ist are we going to be shopping after the pandemic? So das ist our next topic. And for that we're going to welcome Mr. Benjamin Fister, Dr. Benjamin Fister, who has studied econom economics, business and many other things at the University of Passau and Wales. Let's look forward to his presentation and have fun with Dr. Benjamin Fister. Thank you very much for your welcoming words and thank you for inviting me and allowing me to be here. Half a year ago when I said that I would come to this event, I was really looking forward to coming here and being able to interact with all of you and to be able to talk to you all and you know, just have the usual discussions. But as you know, that is unfortunately not possible. But nevertheless, thank you very much to the Toy Business Forum for making this presentation possible in the first place. I would like to introduce myself, even though we are not seeing each other in person. My name is Benjamin Fister. I actually was born quite close nearby in Winsbach, which is in western middle Franconia, not that far away from Nuremberg. You may know that because of the children's choir that is there. And I've been living in Munich for 11 years now. However, I am still very loyal to my soccer team in Winsbach. I've been with Simon Kuche and partners for about six years in the Competence Center for Consumer Goods and Trade. I am the director, the project manager, and I'm specialized in durable consumer goods. And that is one of the reasons why I have been invited here today, and I'm quite happy about that. My experience centers and focuses on end consumer pricing, condition systems from the national level to the global level, especially in the consumer goods industry. But before I start, I would like to say that my presentation does not raise any claims of com being complete. It is more intended to be an inspiration for your own ideas, for discussions, and motivate you to exchange your experiences and hopefully create some dialogue between among yourselves but also with ourselves. If you have any ideas, any feedback, criticism, you can always let me know. You may contact me anytime at the end of the presentation. You will see my contact data as well. And of course, you can always contact us through the Toy Business Forum. When I talk about us, who is us? Some of you may already know who us is. Simon Kuche and Partner is the second largest German business consulting company. We have 1,600 employees worldwide and have a very strong presence in the German speaking regions. We have 42 sites, nine of them in the German-speaking regions, but we have 27 countries in which we are represented. I myself, I live in Munich. The company was established in Bonn, and our most recent subsidiary is in Berlin. And we will be concentrating on digital issues for distributors, for traders, and research. Our focus is clearly on sales growth, especially pricing and optimizing the sales process and strategies. We do that in all of the industries. I am specialized in consumer goods, as I have already mentioned. And one of the things I like the most about our work and what I do as well is that we do not restructure the supply chain or production or purchasing or optimize cost. We actually concentrate on what we'd like to call the sunny side of consulting. And now to start with my presentation, 
As I said, it's, we're going to have to talk about the pandemic again. I know we're all sick of it, but still, I'm going to try to use these 20 to 30 minutes to also kind of see what can happen in the future. What do we believe or what do I or you believe can happen after the pandemic? But let's start with the sunny side of consulting to the rainy bit. I would like to jump back a couple of months. It's a Saturday. It's March 21st, 2020, 3.30 in the afternoon. And at that point in time, I was in the Marienplatz in Munich. Maybe you've been there already. That is the most transited shopping street in Munich. On Saturday, it's usually chock full of people. And on that day, it was like this. I went out for a run. It was raining. It was the first day of the lockdown in Germany. The inner cities, all downtown, was basically deserted, not only because of the climate uh, and, yeah, I had goosebumps because of the situation. It actually felt like a zombie apocalypse, and no one knew how things would continue and go on. This is how downtown Munich looked like on my personal pictures. And the question of how we are going to move forward is something that I would like to talk about today. You have all seen these headlines in the media, on TV, on newspapers. Stationary trade, stationary stores are under massive pressure. City centers are dying out. We have a real bloodletting of the city centers. And also one of the most famous toy stores, department stores in Munich are closing, is closing in, the, um, in early 2023. And it is horrifying to see how many of these huge department stores who have always been there have to close their doors because it is not profitable for them to be in the city centers anymore. And just to stay in Munich, Sportmünziger, Kalsenbach, Schuh, Thomas, Kaut, Bullinger, all of these Stores, all of these names are very no, well known in Munich, but not only local retailers are closing, but also subsidiaries of Douglas, for example, which sells cosmetics and perfumes. They are all moving out of the city center, and in the media, it all sounds as if Corona, uh, the, uh, COVID-19 was the one to blame for everything. But this notion that downtowns are dying out and are becoming deserted is something that has not started with a pandemic. It is something that has been developing throughout the years and months before the pandemic. And that is going to be our starting point for today. Yes, there have been great changes and disruptive changes, but it is more like an accelerator and not the cause of the city centers becoming deserted. So when we have a question like this, how do we approach this question? We have a look at what influences the success of stationary or traditional conventional stores. We have a look at the context, for example, at the economic context, technological context, and currently political context as well, political decisions that we cannot influence. And then we also have a look at competition. What are the others doing? In our case today, what are other toy distributors and retailers doing? But also, what are other distributors and retailers in general doing, even outside of our industry? Because there we can find innovative examples and ideas that can translate quite well to the toy industry as well. And we focus on the consumer at all times. Because we believe that companies may, can only grow sustainably if they are consumer focused. And I mean, not only looking at your current customers, but also the non-customers, the potential customers that are not shopping in our stores today, but might be our customers in the future. And we need to figure out why they are not our customers yet. So when we're talking about 
us in this case, we're talking about the toy industry. As I have already mentioned, we, the pressure on the stationary stores, on conventional stores, has always been around, has been before the, pandem before the pandemic, but the pandemic as a catalyzer. Why? Because the environment, the context has changed. There are things that we cannot influence in our immediate context. We had several lockdowns. We had curfews in the inner cities. We had access restrictions. We have access restrictions. We have to wear masks in the inner cities, indoors. All of these things are things that we cannot influence as manufacturers or as distributors. But then also you have the influences that affect consumers. Consumers who have been avoiding going into the inner cities, they have been avoiding people, masses of people and crowds. And many of them are very confused about what the, the regulations are and the rules are regarding whether we can go into a store or not if you are vaccinated, recovered, or tested. And also they have seen that online shopping is often cheaper, more comfortable, and in the past months, as a consumer, in some areas, we have been basically pushed towards online shopping. We had no other choice. And in that process, even though we perhaps were a bit skeptical about online shopping before, we do have to admit that it is very convenient and makes our life quite easier. So maybe it's something we would like to continue and to keep in future as well. So we are more used to online shopping than we were before. Furthermore, competitions and us in the industry, not only in the toy industry, but also in other industries, we had to come up with different ideas in e-commerce. We had to invest in e-commerce because of the lockdowns. And the toy, in the toy uh, industry, that is a topic that we had not been really dealt with a lot, and now we had to deal with that. So we had to sit down and think about what our channel strategy is and how we are going to approach this new situation. And what resulted from all of this? Here we have a snapshot, snapshot of e-commerce. We can see that it has grown quite substantially. From 2019 to 2020, we have an increase of 23% in the sales volume in online shopping, but that was a trend that has been coming at us from way back. If you have a look at the development of e-commerce since the early 2000s, we can see that last year was the biggest step that we made, but the trend has always been there since the early 2000s, and that's something that we need to be aware of. For us, this means that the inner cities have not started to die out in March 2020, or have been under pressure only since March 2020, but this has been an ongoing process for a couple of years now. And there are some distributors, some sellers that have been adapting to the situation way back, and now the ones who have not done that need to do their homework and catch up. So today I'm speaking to an empty room, but hopefully we'll have the possibility of discussing this in person. We would like to know how are we going, how are consumers going to behave in future? Are we going to do all of our shopping online in future? So I'm just going to throw a couple of ideas into the room, a couple of theses that are intended to be a bit provocative because I want to inspire you to discuss about these topics. And of course, this is not something that we pulled out out of blue, but we do have a, a certain process that we had behind these ideas to see where they come from. For us, the consumer, the customer is always of central importance when we have a look at these challenges. So in the last year and a half, two years, we always tried to look into the market to put ourselves in the shoes of the consumers. What do you think, dear consumers, dear shoppers, how are we going to behave in future when it comes to shopping? So that is going to be the core of my presentation. Um, I'm going to refer to a study from 2020, the future of inner cities. 
where we asked German consumers why what would motivate you to go back downtown? What would motivate you to go to the inner cities when things go back to normal? And what has changed in your preferences and in your attitudes? We also had a study on global touch points in 15 countries, different continents. We surveyed thousands of consumers about how their shopping behavior was before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and how it might change during or after the pandemic. If they would have a shift of preferences to online shopping or in-person shopping, and what would change in that sense. Quite early on, in May 2020, we reached out to our customers and our partners in the industry and asked them what challenges they saw in the industry and how they would affront these challenges. And that's, these are all the studies that have addressed these problems on a global level. And regarding all of these interviews, the surveys, and all the data we have collected, we also complemented it with our own experience worldwide in the past couple of years. We have access to industry experts. We have a lot of experience. We have a look at industry reports and insights from other publications and other studies. And even today, we allow ourselves and give us the permission to give our own opinion and throw some provoking statements into the room to incite discussion. I would like to circle back on the context of how shopping behavior has been developing. It is true that downtowns are dying out. To some extent, however, this is something that also is within the range of decisions for the municipalities and the governments of the cities. Stores alone cannot instill new life into in their cities. Uh, polit politicians also have to get involved. If you have a look at the headlines, you can see that there have been many discussions of what can be done, where you can find where you can find the resources to instill new life into the inner cities. And they talked about investment in the public space, in meeting points. They are not mainly focusing on retailers themselves, even though retailers are an important factor and they have been focusing a lot on online business and have been reducing their stationary, their brick and mortar budgets. But we're talking about more holistic programs on how to revive downtown areas and city centers by focusing not that much on consumption, but more on events and experiences. One example for this would be Bremerhaven, where the department store Karlstadt closed its doors and now it is going to be demolished to be able to create an, an urban space with various uses where you can have a con a trade and stores, but you also have other kinds of interaction for, creati it all for creativity. And it requires a lot of creativity. It is time consuming, time intensive. It is expensive. But uh, we're going to concentrate on other factors as well. What can we as retailers, as manufacturers, do based on the preferences and expectations of our consumers? I would have liked to see your reactions and hear your opinions on public investments on the revival of inner cities. But as I said, it will take some time until we can see the effects of this and perhaps for one retailer or another, it is not too late. So we surveyed consumers. Once the pandemic is over and we have no lockdowns or curfews, what would motivate them to go downtown? What would motivate them to go to the inner cities? And we have seen that Shopping is not a priority anymore. People want to go downtown to meet friends, to meet 
family. They want to support local retailers. They want to go to cafes, to restaurants, to museums, and they want to go to special events. For example, Christmas markets or other events and parties and things that happen in downtowns. That means that shopping is not the focus anymore. They want to spend their free time there. They want to spend their leisure time there, meet with people. They want to have, see and participate in events. That's something that we have had to live without for quite a long time now. Let's talk about consumers now. Because as retailers and as manufacturers, we want to continue selling our products. So we have to really listen to what consumers want and how they want what they want. So one of the big questions here is why do we shop online in the first place and which situations would we prefer to shop offline and why in some industries or some product groups we rather go online to buy them instead of offline. Here as well we have had a look at different consumer studies and I would like to show a couple of the results of these studies. The first question I would like to present is what motivates consumers to buy online. And it does not come as a surprise that the main reasons are convenience. The products are delivered to my doorstep, and it's usually quite fast. When I go shopping, it doesn't take that much time. I don't have to drive into town, look for a parking, slot, parking lot, have to go and look for the store, stand in line, go home. I can do my shopping whenever I want, wherever I want, with my cell phone, with my tablet, my computer, whatever I have at hand. I can search for different products. I can use filters. I can get very detailed product descriptions, pictures, customer opinions, reviews. All of these things, all of this is very convenient and practical. It is fast, and I can do that whenever I want and as I please. That is something that we cannot change back to the ways that were before. We are now used to these practical elements of online shopping. We can actually enjoy them, and we want to keep them in future as well. So what we see here when we compare industries, we don't see any major differences. What I'm saying here applies to toys just like for clothes or for garden equipment or for whiteware, brown goods, whatever, for all kinds of products. It becomes more interesting when we ask ourselves why consumers would like to go to a stationary outlet and then nevertheless do an online or have an online shopping experience. Now, what is the most important thing or the most important reason for online shopping? So why do people go to a brick and mortar store? Because they don't have to wait. They can take the item they want to buy immediately, like the child. The child actually reaches out and wants to touch it immediately, and that's the most important thing for the toys industry, really relevant for the toys industry, because consumers want to touch products. They want to get the look and feel of the product, the touch and feel feel impression is so much more important as soon as we talk about infants or small children or babies because we only want to buy the best for our children. We don't want to pay any delivery fees. And of course, we would also like to support our stationary retailers, our local retailers. Ecological aspects play an important role, but you can take the item home with you immediately. You can touch it. You can experience it. So that's the most important reason for buying it um, in the shop. And let me share one experience I had with you. I had a project with a toy manufacturer, and for this manufacturer it was extremely important that customers should know that uh, they offer a high level of quality. Some of their toys were produced in Germany, which is expensive to produce, but consumers are ready to pay the premium for this kind of production. And we tried to find out what the value drivers are, what are the consumers are ready to pay a premium for. This happened during the pandemic last year. So normally, we would then organize a workshop where we sit together at a table where we touch the product, where we compare products, where we discuss products, which was not possible because of the pandemic, and this is why we printed small cards on paper, which we spread out on the table in front of us, and then we talked into the computer, as I'm doing today, and we discussed with our customers 
how we could explain to a, a consumer that uh, the quality of one product is better than the quality of another product. So we had a lively discussion when we talked about dolls because we were asking, now those two products, from our point of view, from an external observer's point of view, are exactly identical and one product is five euros more expensive. Why? Now, the reason was because um, the surface is so much softer, softer to the touch, very natural, no synthetic odor or nothing unpleasant here. So things which you can not see on a screen. You could not see it when you do your shopping online. It would be difficult to get the feeling across digitally. And this is what the toys industry needs to focus on. The touch and feel, the actual experience of the product is much more important than when, let's say, you buy a fridge or a TV set or a new mobile phone. Now, another thing that um, we noticed is when we compare the different industries, the different sectors of industry, uh, then we see that particularly when we survey shoppers in the toy segment, the aspect of uh, combining um, a shopping spree or going to the city just for shopping with leisure time activities and the inspiration you get in the shop, the atmosphere in the shop, are much more important than in any other industry. Now, when you take um, your child with you, when you go shopping, this is an experience. It's a kind of event for the family. It's different from going to the supermarket, getting your supplies like toilet paper and butter for the next week. You you want to combine this with other activities, and I rarely ever look for a specific product. Much less than in other shopping situations do I know what I'm really looking for. I want to be inspired. I want to browse. I want to look around in the store. I want to touch things, try them out. And that's something that uh, you could not find in an online shopping experience, and particularly as far as toys are concerned. The situation, the actual physical situation in the shop is so much more important than in other industries. Now, what is the consequence of all of this? What does it lead to? When we then finally ask consumers, now what do you think? How are you going to change your shopping behavior in future? How is it going to be different than before? We had a pandemic. We had an external shock hitting our industry. So what is going to happen afterwards? What is going to happen in terms of looking for inspiration and information and the actual shopping transaction? What is it going to mean for this? Now, shoppers of toys, much less than shoppers in other categories, uh, will say, I'll I'm going to do more online than before. Now, online trading will increase in all industries, also for toys, but the expected use of online channels by consumers is less significant or is increasing less significantly than in other industries. As you can see on the right-hand side, uh, when it comes to the actual purchasing uh, for large household appliances, you can get all of the information online. You don't want to, or you don't need to touch the product, and it's very convenient if it's delivered to your home. So there, in future, we expect a lot more online shopping for household appliances, but for toys and for fashion, you want to touch the product. You want to feel it, you want to experience it before you decide to purchase it. Now, what does it mean for toy retailers and manufacturers? Now, in our opinion, in future, we have to increasingly try to combine the benefits of both worlds, what consumers like about online shopping, what they like about offline shopping. We have to combine it, and this is what we refer to as omni-channel strategy. And the examples I have shown you so far are basically black and white. Most of the retailers and um, distributors and manufacturers are no longer just online or offline players. They usually use several channels already, but I'd like to conclude with a couple of examples which show you how using innovative methods, the borders between these channels can be, well, actually abandoned and can disappear so that we can flexibly jump back and forth between the channels as consumers, depending on our respective situation. Because, and it's something that might never have been true ever, there are no pure online or offline shoppers. We are all somewhere in the middle. Some of us are further to the left or to the right of the spectrum. But depending on the situation, we will decide whether one way of shopping is more convenient today or another 
a situ or another type of shopping is more convenient in a different situation. So we actually move between those two worlds anyway. So the barriers to changing between the channels must be minimized. That must be the objective so that these channels can increasingly merge with each other. And I'd like to conclude with a couple of very well illustrating examples which I deliberately didn't take from the toy industry. There we also have examples, but from other industries, and we believe in other industries, they are even more relevant at the moment. The first example, well, obviously Amazon, a pioneer for many trends and tendencies which we observe in the retail sector. And it's not new. Amazon now has its own um, physical or stationary shops, has had them for many years, and they have a new project as of the middle of the year, close to Los Angeles, and that's really new. It's a fashion outlet. It's a fashion store which is operated by Amazon. It's called Amazon Style. And what's so nice about this store, or what's the new thing about this concept? In this shop, you get exactly one T-shirt in one size, in one color, and are 10 or 12 or 15 items of the same color and size. And Amazon can then show many more products. They don't waste any shelf space because they have to store all of these sizes and colors. No, they just show one product. And anything around it can be then um, be delivered um, at the push of a button directly to the um, changing room or the cash register. And that means a lot of uh, space. And that's something that we otherwise only have when we do shopping online. With our mobile phone, we can scan in the QR code or barcode of a product. Then we can see in what versions it comes, in what sizes, whether it's on stock, and what the other shoppers say about it. So reviews and experience of other shoppers can also be included. And of course, anything I buy will be stored in my app, and the retailer the dealer can then derive personalized recommendations for me or well, products that are on sale um, according to my preference has, can be offered to me and I don't have to go back to the store once I know that I like the color or that the size fits. And another new aspect, which is even much more convenient, I believe. Anything that's not available in the shop can be ordered to the shop within just a couple of days. You can try it on and you can return it directly to the shop if you don't like it. So um, platforms such as Zalando um, mean that people buy five or order five shoes and return f or five pairs of shoes and four pairs of shoes are returned. But this is much more um, environmentally um, less of an environmental burden, much more ecological, and it saves a lot of time and expense. Now, Amazon, extreme example, invests a lot of money in new developments. But uh, also, the previous, well, conventional, traditional brick and mortar trade can change as well. IKEA, for instance, Vienna, the Western railway station, for about half a year, they've had um, an inner city branch office of IKEA, and uh, they have a sustainable focus. They have photovoltaics on the roof. They have parking space for bicycles. They have um, access to the public transport system and the green facade. So sustainability is the motto here. And then when we go to the, sh to the store, to IKEA, and when we um, want to take a product with us. There are not too many products which you would take along immediately from IKEA. But when you take it out of the shelf, the shelf will be refilled automatically. So customers will never stand in front of an empty shelf, which might be frustrating. And on the rooftop, we have this of this store. There's a snack bar, there's a hotel, and you have a nice view of the inner city of Vienna. So we have a direct connection between shopping and leisure time activities. You can also just um, decide to meet somebody up there on the rooftop, meet your friends after shopping to have a glass of beer or to then um, do sightseeing in the city. So the connection with leisure time activities is actively promoted here. And with most of the large products, you can decide whether you want to take it home with you with click and collect, whether it should be delivered to your home. You can touch and see everything. And in your app, you can then decide, I want to have it at this point in time, then it should be delivered to me. And if there are any access restrictions, if there's a lockdown during a pandemic like COVID-19, then directly with the app that you can use to scan prices or retrieve information, you can book a slot. Um, during which you can then come to the store. So as a consumer, things um, are 
I find things that usually uh, consume a lot of time very convenient here. But it doesn't have to be an entirely new shop concept like uh, Amazon's concept or Ikea's concept. One very recent example, I read it yesterday in the newspaper Decathlon in Munich, in future, and this is a test, this is a pilot, they will deliver on the same day with a cargo bike cargo bicycle. So you can make use of the benefits of online shopping. You don't have to go to the inner city, but online you just look at products which might be interesting for you. You choose a product, you can see whether it's available or not. You click on it, and if you order before 3.30 in the afternoon, on the same day, your running shoes will be delivered to you. You can go running in the same evening, but you don't have to go to the city. You don't have to wait in front of the shop. And um, you can avoid having contact with other people, which is something you might not wish to have at the moment. So very convenient, minimum waiting time, and delivered by cargo bike, which of course contributes to the sustainability of the retailer in this particular case. A very simple example of DM. You can see on the homepage of the retailer where a product is available in which of their stores. So yesterday in the evening, if I wanted to get a water bottle for my SodaStream um, device, I shouldn't have gone to um, Augustenstraße. I would have had to walk to Leopoldstraße, of course. I live close to Augustenstraße, and if I don't know that the product is out of stock there, I'll be frustrated as a consumer because I go to the shop and the product is not available. But if you check it out online before, you can see which store has it. So this. Um, it's obvious to see that uh, this kind of tool could also be used for toy stores. You want to go to the shop, you want to touch the product, but you want to make sure that you don't go to the wrong branch. My personal experience just before Christmas was for um, newborn infant, I wanted to buy wooden letters for the door, which attached to the door to um, indicate the name of the baby. Um, uh, well, actually, up until now, I still don't know where to actually get them. I know who might have them, but I don't know where to get them. Now, a couple of provocative theses on the future of uh, the brick and mortar stores in the toy segment. Number one, there's no way back. This is something that won't change. There's an ongoing trend towards online shopping, and that's good because it means a lot of convenience for us as consumers. It offers lots of benefits. Retailers and manufacturers will have to continue to invest in e-commerce and digitization, and uh, many only recognized it very late over the past few years. But we shouldn't rest on our laurels here because we have to actually think uh, the, about the next few steps because the others won't sleep as well. And um, second, there's no apocalypse looming here in the near future. Inner cities won't be deserted very soon, but uh, there will be fewer um, people going to the inner cities um, and consumption alone won't be the main reason to go to the inner cities. People want to go there to meet people. Uh, they want to experience the inner city, and that's something that uh, the retailers have to prepare themselves for and adapt to. Third, there will continue to be toy stores also in the future because, as I said, the touch and feel is so important in this segment. And it's fun. It's a shopping experience that people don't want to dispense with also in the future. But nevertheless, based upon the examples which I showed you, we believe that it is going to be the way into the future to come up with a hybrid concept. So as I said, the borders between online and offline shopping, between convenience and experience, these borders need to be minimized, need to be um, eliminated so that both channels can merge. And there will be new challenges. That's the fourth point. Nobody expected the corona pandemic. It was a big shock to all of us, but it also um, led to innovation. And this should be seen as an opportunity for the retailers also in future. There will also in future be external shocks. To trade is to change. And because of these external shocks, there will also be new ideas, creative concepts, um, even concepts that we cannot even imagine today. And last but not least, for me personally, the good news is the inner city of Munich won't become deserted. That's what I heard yesterday in the afternoon. Lego is going to open its largest German flagship store this year in the pedestrian area of Munich. 
in basically the same place of which I showed you a picture before at the beginning of my um, presentation. So particularly in the toy segment, there are some players which move back into the inner cities. They take this step and actually go back there to the inner city. So at this point, I would otherwise um, hand over to the audience and would say, are there any questions uh, or comments? Is there anything that you agree with or anything that you would object to? I would like to really urge you to do it nevertheless. I mean, not today in person, because it's not possible, but you have my contact details here. That's um, Benjamin Fister at Simon minus Kuka.com or the colleagues of the Toy Business Forum, you might contact them as well. So thank you for your kind attention. I wish you exciting presentations, good discussions, and I do hope that there will come a day where we can meet in person. Thank you.